Merry Christmas. I love Christmas. The lights, the, the cookies. <laughs> I love Christmas. Merry Christmas. The presents have been opened. Uh, the leftovers have been uh, snacked on. We've had our cookie binges, at least I've had mine. Our sugar rushes, we've reconnected with family members. We've celebrated the birth of a Savior, God incarnate, God with us, Jesus Christ. And for many of us, tomorrow brings us back to everyday life. For many of us, it's back to work tomorrow, back to taking out the trash, morning commutes, and reminding yourself to get the mortgage or the rent in on time. Uh, the first is on Thursday, by the way. In a few days, we're going to be back to figuring out what's on TV tonight, balancing after school schedules, and kicking ourselves for eating that extra slice of leftover pie. That is, if you have any leftover pie, if we were all that lucky. For many of us, it's back to our regular lives tomorrow. I got a proposal for you. Don't. Don't. Don't let your life be business as usual. We welcomed a savior. We welcomed the birth of God himself, savior of the world in this very room on this very space just four days ago. He is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, king of kings. He came to change everything. He came to set into motion a brand new reality. He was the answer of thousands of years of prayer and sacrifice. In that moment, in a manger, 2,000 years ago, reality itself changed in a way that makes it impossible to ever go back. He came to forgive us. He came to forgive you, all of us, forever. Your job is not the same. The primetime lineup on NBC is not the same. Kids' sports schedules, even taking out the trash, are not the same. The holiday might be over, but reality itself is changed. Don't let yourself just go back and settle into your old habits. Jesus was born for you to die for you. Lift your head to heaven and let that fact sink in just for a second. He was born for you. God himself was born for you and he offers you a new beginning in his death and resurrection. Take it. Look at your life through the eyes of heaven and embrace the new beginning offered to us in Christ. Now is your chance We've celebrated the birth of a savior and now we're about to celebrate the beginnings of a new year. Let's go into 2015, changed people. Let's have 2015 be the year when our lives reflect the glory of God brighter than ever before. Let our lives be blinding because we've embraced Christmas and made it more than just a day. So, in that note, Merry Christmas. Today we're going to look at a story of renewal. A story of a shifted reality, thanks to the forgiveness of God. But we're not looking at the Christmas story, per se. Today we're going to look at King David. See, we're jumping back into the story. A 31-week journey into the ongoing story of God and his people. We're going through each and every story in the Bible in chronological order in the order that it happened in time, on Sunday morning, throughout the week in small groups, and in your own personal study, letting each story fill in the next piece of God's greater story. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of this mission, or maybe you feel like you missed the boat in the last six months when we've been doing this, and you, you felt like you, you didn't get connected with the small group in time, so you've missed your chance. If that's the case... I would like to personally invite you right now to come on this journey with us, okay? You can pick up your own copy of the story. This is the book we're using kind of as our guide through this section. Pick up your own copy of the story in Connection Central at the end of the service. It's five bucks. It's the amount we paid to get it here, all right? We just want to get this book out to as many people as we can, okay? If you're looking for a small group to get involved with, 
Talk to me, Rich, or any of the pastors here, and we will get you the resources. We will get you in contact with the people. We will get you into a small group as soon as we can. Okay? It's not too late. We started back in August, I believe August, with a look at the biblical account of creation. I had to say that very slowly because my mouth wouldn't do those words. A look at the biblical account of, biblical account of creation. <laughs> we followed the timeline through the stories of Abraham, Joseph, Moses. We learned about the courage of Joshua with the leadership of the judges, God's provision for Ruth, We were introduced to a man after God's own heart, David. David was the anointed successor to Saul, Israel's first real king. He was anointed as a shepherd boy after being chosen by God, even though he didn't fall anywhere in the blood succession. Saul, the current king, had a son. His name was uh, Jonathan, but Jonathan was not going to be king. God decided David was going to be king, a shepherd boy. Well, while he was anointed as a boy, he was not actually crowned king for many years. Okay? And in that time, God used David in a whole bunch of ways. This is where we see the story of David and Goliath. David defeats Goliath with God's help. Actually, God defeats Goliath with David's help, probably more like. <laughs> he went on to become a mighty warrior And even for a chapter, was running for his life from Saul, who at that time was broken and jealous and didn't want to give up uh, ruling the country. Eventually, David is crowned and is absolutely loved as Israel's king. He was known for his deep, deep, deep devotion and his palpable faith, tangible faith. You could not meet this man and not understand his relationship with God. However, it is He is far, far from perfect, far from sinless. On the contrary, David's reign almost ended in complete disgrace due to his sinful actions. 2 Samuel chapter 11 sets the tone here for the story. In the spring, at a time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the, from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, Uriah the Hittite, Uriah, is actually a soldier in David's army. At this time, Uriah is with Joab. He's out at war. He's fighting Israel's enemies on the command of King David. So here's David on the palace roof, gazing out over his kingdom, and he happens to gaze upon a beautiful woman bathing. He could have stopped there. It's obviously an inappropriate moment. He could have stopped there, but he didn't. He pursues her. In fact, he sleeps with Bathsheba. Bathsheba becomes pregnant. David's got a problem. Trying to cover up his mistake, David calls Uriah, the Hittite, her husband, back from war under made-up pretenses, finding a reason to get Uriah back from war for a couple days. You see, he was trying to set up a scenario where Uriah would go to the comfort of his wife, spend the night in his bed with his wife, providing a scenario where it might be understandable that she would be pregnant. However, Uriah is a very honorable man. And as long as his brothers in arms were out fighting and dying for the king's word, he was not going to enjoy a moment of comfort, least of all from his wife, because his brothers in arms weren't allowed that option. And so after three nights, Uriah went back to the front, and David's scheme failed. So, continuing on verse 14, this is what David did. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah in his way back. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. 
So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest city defenders were, where the fighting would be fiercest. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Not only did David commit adultery, but he did so with the wife of one of his own soldiers, currently fighting, risking their life on David's command. This is not only a betrayal of the marriage bed, but it's also a betrayal of loyalty to his own men, to say nothing of a betrayal of God's law. David messed up big. What does he do? He tries to cover up his sin. He doubles down and ends up arranging the death of Uriah so that he can sweep in, quickly marry Bathsheba, and claim the child of his own without anybody being the wiser. So in the end, stealing an inappropriate gaze from a rooftop turns into adultery, betrayal, and causing a man's death, all to cover his own shame. It took Nathan, God's prophet in Israel, to finally show David just what he'd done, just how far he missed the mark, how much shame he was carrying. David, finally shocked at his own sin, falls to his knees, begging God for forgiveness for what he had done. And he actually writes in this, in this time period, Psalm 51. And this is his words to God. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Skipping ahead to verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Create in me a pure heart. Wash away my iniquity. David was broken before God. His sin had broken him. David saw the damage that he had caused and was intimately aware of just how far he had fallen from God's will. This was the man who was supposed to be after God's own heart, the palpable faith, loving David. He had a personal relationship with God and everyone knew it. Yet now he had chosen to become a liar, an adulterer, a betrayer, a murderer. Realizing his fall, David cries out in repentance. That's the word I want to talk about today, repentance. Repentance... When I say that word, chances are good that you picture something looking like, like this guy right here. Like this guy. There we go. That's what we see in our culture when we hear the word repent. Repent, for the end is nigh. Turn and burn. Or turn or burn, actually. While his intentions might be absolutely honorable, desperately desperately wanting to get the message out to take God seriously, he's often characterized as angry, belligerent, dismissive, often seen as combative and uncompromising. This person stands in the street corner and yells words of judgment and all who pass within earshot. This is the image we get of repentance often in our culture. This, con- this image conjures hate speech and, and ignorant agendas, self-righteous call for judgment on the sinful while enjoying a place of grace and privilege in our own worldview. Before you nod in agreement with me, the reverse of that also has some issues. I love you, you love me, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, everything's okay. You don't need to repent, everything's cool, you got nothing to be sorry for, you're just being you. See, this is too accepting. It's blind to sin. We become so focused on making people feel happy and comfortable that the need for repentance, true repentance and submission to God, these become alien concepts in our world. Motivations might be solid. This guy tries to be a beacon of peace in a world 
defined by constant conflict, but he stretches that grace to the point of justification for others' sin. The need for repentance and brokenness before God gets replaced with phrases like, I deserve this. This is just how God made me. It seems like these two extremes are the most common ways that we as a culture process this concept of repentance. Either we see it as a throwdown, combative stance against the world, trying to preserve some shred of holiness or perception of holiness in a fallen world, or we instantly get a bad taste in our mouth about the concept of repentance and go the other way and try to justify all the reasons why repentance isn't necessary. There's a place in Kansas where these two extremes seem to be, at least in my, my worldview here, more visible than any other place on earth. Southwest 12th Street is this tiny little road in the heart of what would normally be a regular, quiet neighborhood in Topeka, Kansas. It's the Westboro neighborhood in Topeka. It just seems like any other quiet neighborhood, except for these two neighbors across the street from each other that are diametrically opposed in this concept. On one side, you have the infamous Westboro Baptist Church. Tiny community, really tiny community when you think about it, surprisingly tiny community, of only about 30 to 50 individuals who have gained international infamy by picketing the funerals of soldiers and Hollywood celebrities, all in an attempt to call Americans to task for the sin of homosexuality in our culture. Their language and strategies have caused them to be completely disowned by any association of Baptist churches, making their use of the name Baptist kind of problematic. And their hateful actions and hate speech um, raise serious doubts on whether they can really use the term church. As I said before, the name Westboro actually comes from the neighborhood that they're in, this little quiet neighborhood within Topeka. Though the residents are not exactly proud of their infamous neighbors. Directly across this tiny little road, barely wide enough for two cars to pass each other, sits the Rainbow House. This is a ranch-style home painted in the rainbow colors adopted by LGTB communities all over the country here. The Rainbow House is a statement of tolerance. I, I got this from their website. Rainbow House is a statement of tolerance and acceptance for teens and young adults who identify as homosexual. It serves as a community space in direct opposition to the teachings of the Westboro Baptist Church. There they are, right across the street from each other, close enough to shout over for a cup of sugar. I bet that happens all the time. Well, last year, I had the chance to see this actually in person, okay? Ben Sander and I, a guy who was just leading worship up here, were leading a trip of, uh, of college students from our Ignition Ministry, which is our college ministry here at the church. We were leading a trip down to the Passion Worship Conference in Houston, Texas. And our route driving there drove right through Topeka, Kansas. So we decided, we're you know, a little ahead of the game, we decided to take a, uh, an hour or so take a diversion, let's find out what all the fuss is about in the news, let's find this Westboro Baptist Church, and let's stop and pray. So we drove our little van, and we drove right down this little tiny street between these two buildings. And you know, what stood out most, and what these pictures really fail to show you, was just how small and nondescript this street was, and these buildings were. I mean, that, right here, it looks like that, that church is huge, it's really kind of tiny, you could probably fit the whole building in this room. There were no angry picketers, no rallies, just a tiny street in an otherwise completely nondescript neighborhood. Yet it represents the epicenter of one of the loudest and most spirited social debates in our country. And here's our van full of idealistic college students driving between them at five miles per hour while praying for some sort of reconciliation between these two camps. It was an, an interesting image <laughs> that stuck with me. On each side of the street stood a statement on the nature of repentance. On one side, they demanded it with threats of divine retribution and self-righteous indignity. While the other side, they resist it, claiming that grace should be our only stance, and therefore we should keep divine judgment out of our hands. It's not our place. Just be you. 
both sides have elements that are absolutely correct. Not kidding. Both sides have elements that are absolutely correct. But both sides are also absolutely wrong when it comes to understanding repentance. And they're not alone. We often struggle with this concept. We often struggle with it. So what is repentance? Well, let me start by saying what repentance is not because there's a lot of misconceptions in our culture. Repentance is not merely an apology. Okay, it's not an apology. When someone repents, they're not just saying, I'm sorry. Think about it, how we use that phrase in our culture. We use apologies as simply an acknowledgement of pain or wrongdoing. We're just acknowledging it. There often isn't any responsibility attached to the words. We say, we say I'm sorry out of sympathy. If your friend comes up to you today and says, oh my gosh, someone broke into my car, they stole my stereo, and all my, all my I guess we, have, we don't really have CDs anymore, but they stole all my stuff, and, uh, and now I have to pay to replace the glass. You'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. If you said, I repent, she's mad at you and now you're being hauled away in handcuffs. Right? Well, why is that? Why is that? It's because these are different concepts. An apology simply recognizes that mistakes were made, that pain is caused. Repentance is more. Repentance is not simply a contract to get grace, either. This is not some magical incantation. You can't say, yeah, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but it's all good because I'll repent later and I'll be fine. That's not how it works. Repentance is not an incantation. It's not saying magic words and then, and then God hears that and is like a genie and just goes, oh, I guess I have to give you grace now. Here you go. It's not a contract that forces God's hand. God's love is not a commercial exchange. It's not a tit-for-tat thing. The repentance, real repentance, is more than an apology. It's falling at the feet of Jesus, broken by your sin. Finally, and this is a big one, repentance can never be coerced. This is where Westboro Baptist gets it wrong. Repentance can never be coerced. The decision to fall at the feet of Jesus and repent for our misdeeds must, must, by definition, be a free decision. You cannot be forced to make that decision, whether by violence, threats, or social pressure. If you were forced to make that decision, then it is not a free decision, and then I can't be sure that you're making that decision. You're making it to appease someone else. I don't need you to appease someone else. I need you to be convicted by God and stand before God clean. It cannot be coerced out of you. You have, have to come before God because your desire to be cleansed is true because God has convicted you, not me, and not because of social pressures. True repentance, the decision to submit to Christ, can never be coerced. So we talked about what repentance is not. What is repentance, really? Repentance means to turn away to change. Okay, in Hebrew, in Hebrew, go ahead and the next slide. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is teshuva. Teshuva literally means to turn back, to change direction. Likewise, in the New Testament, where Greek is the language that they write in, the word is mantineo. Mantineo. Mantineo literally means to change one's inner self. So to turn back, to change one's inner self. In other words, the concept of repentance is much more than simply acknowledging your wrongdoing. The act of repenting also has to include change, changing your inner self, turning back to God. The act of repenting necessarily includes a direct and active course change, a difference from now on. You are different, changed, and forgiven, and as such, you act different, changed, and forgiven. This is why when we baptize you, we put you under the water. This signifies death, burial, and then we pull you up, signifying resurrection and new life, because your old life is gone. 
To repent is to turn back to God, stop in your tracks, turn around, run with all your strength from your sin and towards the arms of the Father. It is a revolution, a fundamental shift in your identity. You are no longer your old self. And it shows because you are running full tilt towards the Father. Repentance is also submission. And this is where the rainbow house gets it wrong. God's ways are above our ways. We don't get to dictate what's right and wrong. Submission is a dirty word in our culture. We prize individuality, freedom to fail. Our heroes are people who look at certain defeats and never back down, never stop fighting, all in the hopes that freedom would prevail. The DNA of our culture is rebellion. It's not a bad thing, but it's something we need to understand. We resist control wherever possible. Think about it. Whatever movie you've recently seen, look at the bad guy. The bad guy is trying to control everybody. The good guy is the guy trying to resist control. If you're watching a movie and you don't know who the bad guy is, just watch and try to figure out who is trying to control everybody. That's how our culture works. That's how our culture thinks. As a culture, submission is an alien concept. Yet it's necessary for real repentance. Fighting against a controlling power is only good when the controlling power is evil, selfish, or does not have your best interest at heart. In our case, God is not evil. He's the controlling power, and he is not evil. Rather, he is the source of everything that is good. He is not selfish, but rather he in fact sacrifices his own son on our behalf. And he absolutely has your best interest at heart. He made you and literally has moved heaven to earth on your behalf. So throw down your weapons and stop fighting. Submit to the path that he has for you. You won't like it always. Often, you will not like it. Sometimes submitting to God, especially from within our sin, is extremely difficult. Turning away from the next drink, coming clean with your spouse, or reconciling with an estranged family member, these are some of the most incredibly, incredibly difficult decisions and situations that we can ever be our, put ourselves in. But God has called you to that action, and he will carry you through. Old self is gone. New self, submission to God, is what prevails. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Repentance must include submission, a sacrifice of your old self, and a submission to what God has in store for you. So repentance is not an apology. It is not a contract. It is not coercive. Repentance is turning away and submitting to God. It's reconciliation with God. And now comes the most important thing that I will ever say from this pulpit or anywhere else in my life. These words, if you've been sleeping, listen now. God, God, does not regret making you. God does not regret making you. God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it one bit. You are a prized, prized creation. You are a masterpiece. But Josh, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You don't know the people I've hurt. You're right, I don't. But I know what Jesus did. And I know that he would say he's already paid your bill in full and and he's wiping out those dark spots in your past. I know that he would say what you said is nonsense because he already paid for it. David was a lying, cheating, betraying murderer. Yet he cried out to God to redeem him and God did just that. David went on to become Israel's greatest king and established a family that led to the birth of the king of kings, born in a manger. 
So whether you're here because you're already a regular attender, or here because you're visiting family for the holidays, or you wandered in because you heard we had donuts and cookies, it happens. Time and circumstances have led us all to this moment right now. You're supposed to be sitting here right now so that we can remind you of this one fact, and that is that God adores you. God adores you. Maybe it's a reminder, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time, but God adores you, and he desperately wants you to come back to him. He wants you to run to him. He wants you to find your way back to God, and that is what true repentance is. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you broken and sinful people, we want, we want you to take our burdens, all the weights that we carry. Lord, we lift them up to you, take them. We leave them at your feet. We fall before your feet, broken. We're running to you with all our strength, God. Heal us, make us new. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for thinking us, thank you for thinking us beautiful enough to do that. Thank you for loving us despite our misdeeds. God, we just respond by saying we love you. Heal us. In Jesus' name, amen.